everyone and good day. The Coordinating Center for the National Drug Early Warning System, sponsored by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, welcomes you to our second End News Presents webinar of 2019. The End News PI is Dr. Eric Wish, and our NIDA project scientist is Moira O'Brien. I am sure that both of them are in the audience with us this afternoon. My name is Erin Artijani, the End News Co-I. Marwa Al Nasir and I will be the facilitators for this webinar. We are part of the NDUS Coordinating Center team. For those who are interested, you can find detailed information about NDUS, recordings of our prior webinars, and invitations to future webinars on our website at www.endus.org. You will also find instructions for how to join our NDUS network and participate in ongoing discussions with more than 1,300 experts and concerned citizens from across the United States and many other countries. We developed the NDUS Presents webinars to work with leading substance abuse experts to explore emerging drugs and timely drug-related topics. This month, we are exploring how to use science to shape drug policy. And today, we are very fortunate to be joined by Dr. Robert DuPont, President of the Institute for Behavior and Health and Clinical Professor of Psychiatry at the Georgetown University School of Medicine. Dr. DuPont was the first director of NIDA and the second White House drug chief. Dr. DuPont is also a member of the NDU Scientific Advisory Group, or SAG, and a strong supporter of the NDU's network and our mission to monitor drug trends and provide a scientific basis for discussing and responding to these trends and supporting, to those, and supporting those with substance use disorders. This webinar will be approximately 60 to 90 minutes long. We encourage you to submit questions during and after the presentation. Please do not raise your hand, rather post your questions in the Q&A box. We will hold a brief Q&A session after Dr. DuPont has spoken. Dr. DuPont, Marwa, and I will do our best to get to all of your questions, and we will try to address any remaining questions after the webinar. A recording of this webinar and a copy of the presenter's slides will be made available on our website, www.endus.org. Just give us a few days to get everything up and posted. And now I'm pleased to introduce our Endus PI and Director of CSER, Eric Wish, who would like to share a few words. Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar. You know, I've learned over the past never to uh, speak after a uh, great speaker. So I thought, uh, given how articulate Dr. DuPont is, uh, I would say a few words before he goes on. So um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I met Dr. DuPont. In the late 70s, I had the privilege of uh, being a NIDA-sponsored postdoctoral fellow at the Washington University uh, School of Medicine and Department of Psychiatry, working with the late uh, Dr. Lee Robbins. And as many of you may know, Lee Robbins um, basically ran the classic Vietnam follow-up study for the government. And when I was there, I really met the who's who of the drug field. So I met Dr. Jerome Jaffe, who was the first director of SAADAP, which at the time was President, I think President Nixon's Special Action Office for Drug Abuse Prevention. Um, and then I met Dr. DuPont, who basically took over from Dr. Jaffe and later became, uh, that group became uh, NIDA. And I remember Dr. DuPont, uh, I would be in Lee's office and Dr. DuPont would be calling very excitedly to find out what she was finding in her research. So anyway, when I um, finally went to visit from St. Louis to the big city of Washington, D.C., I happened to go to a conference where uh, Dr. DuPont was presenting. I think he may have been NIDA director at the time. And I was just amazed at how eloquently he could speak about drug policy using data. And for me, he became a role model of how to incorporate the types of data we epidemiologists collect into creating and informing drug policy. Uh, many of you may not know, you may know a lot of his accomplishments, but you may not know that in um, April of, Bob will, um, Dr. DuPont, I'm sure will correct me, in April of 1970 or 71, April 1st, I believe it was, it was not an April Fool's joke, he went in and started the pretrial arrestee drug testing program in Washington, D.C. And that program, which continues to this day, formed the basis of the Duff and Adam program which is a program I know that many people uh, who were on the former, uh, on the CEWG, used to like to use the Duff-Adam program. Well, I like to say it all came about because of Dr. DuPont's vision 
of collecting urine specimens to measure drug use in, in arrestees. Now, I know that sometimes Dr. DuPont's ideas are controversial. controversial. We've talked a lot over the years, and he knows that we don't always agree. But I'll tell you, he always inspires me. And he, he, um, his ideas always get me to ask questions about my interpretation of my findings and about drug policy. So that's been very valuable to me over my whole career. He's been a lifelong supporter of Caesar in our research. And it is with that that I give you, you didn't come to listen to me. I give you, it is my pleasure to turn the microphone over to Dr. Robert DuPont. Much, Eric. It's a great privilege for me to be here today and to do this. I want to go back a little bit on history with you uh, for for our for our group today. Uh, our topic is about uh, using science uh, in drug policy or inspiring uh, drug policy with science. Uh, and Eric was talking about how he learned epidemiology, and that was with Lee Robbins. She she was the Dean of Epidemiology and Drug Abuse, and her study of the Vietnam uh, uh, War, the veterans, uh, heroin use, uh, was a landmark study uh, as a study, but it had a profound effect uh, on our country where there was a lot of concern uh, about the returning veterans uh, bringing heroin addiction back into the country. And, and Lee's study was a model uh, for exactly what Eric's talking about, about using science uh, to uh, lead policy, not just influence policy, but lead policy. And I am so honored because of Caesar uh, and the epidemiologic work that Caesar does, uh, and, and so impressed with Eric Wish and our relationship and his leading, uh, leading epidemiologist and his vision uh, that is expressed through Caesar. So uh, I want to thank you, Eric, and, and thank Caesar. Uh, and, uh, and NDUS, and I'm very proud that it's supported by NIDA, uh, which I was the first director. So let us begin with that. Okay, this is our topic today, uh, using science to shape drug policy, past, present, and future. And I'm focusing, if, if uh, I started in this uh, uh, July 1st, 1968. So we're just a little past 50 years that I've been engaged in dealing with drug abuse and addiction as the center of my career. And so what I'm going to do today is, is focus on uh, a few central issues uh, there uh, and, uh, and talk specifically about the relations with science in the evolution of those positions. This is, uh, by, by way of disclosure, I don't have any conflicts to report. Uh, my background is I, I started in, in, as I mentioned, in July 1st, 1968. I came to work for the District of Columbia Department of Corrections because I cared about the people who were in prison. And I was, wanted to use my medical knowledge. I was a graduate of the Harvard Medical School and, and NIH, and I wanted to do something that would be helpful to those people who were in prison. And that's why I, I went to work in the DC Department of Corrections. Uh, in that uh, time, in 1968, we had a presidential election. Uh, Richard Nixon, who was running for president and became president, uh, called District of Columbia the crime capital of the nation because of the crime epidemic that was going on. Uh, and uh, that gave me an opportunity, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in, in just a minute, uh, but it really was through the door of a prison uh, that I got into drug abuse. Uh, uh, then I, uh, and I also have had a practice of clinical psychiatry, and I'll tell you some more about that. Uh, but since 1969, so this is my 50th year of having my own practice seeing patients, and that's going to be very important to what you're going to hear. Uh, I started the Narcotics Treatment Administration in Washington in 1970. I was first director of NIDA in 73. I also was the head of the White House Drug Office, then called SEADAP, as uh, Eric was talking about. And since 1978, I've been uh, president of the Institute for Behavior and Health a think tank devoted to developing uh, new and better ideas in drug policy. And also since 1980, I've been clinical professor of psychiatry at Georgetown. Now I've published more than 400 professional articles. Uh, the books you see there are listed. Uh, the most recent one is Chemical Slavery, Understanding Addiction and Stopping the Drug Epidemic. I also have an interest in anxiety disorders that you see there. Uh, and, and the other books that I, that I have published. I'm very proud of chemical slavery, and you'll hear more about that as we go on. Here's an example of the book, and a, a picture of the book. And the thing that, uh, that uh, I, I focus on that is uh, 
different in some ways, and I, I like to think of as a contribution, uh, is to understand more about the hijacked brain, how the uh, thinking and behavior of a person uh, who is addicted to drug is changed by the brain effects of uh, the addictive chemicals, and also the, uh, the, the miracle of recovery. Uh, there are no hopeless addicts. Uh, every addict is capable of recovery. And uh, the recovery of drug addiction, from drug addiction, is the inspiration for my career. Now, it, as I mentioned, I was in a practice. And, and the, my patients and watching families, oftentimes, uh, over even three generations, uh, has been, that's been the most powerful uh, teachers I've had have been the people I have worked with individually uh, uh, grappling with addiction. Okay, I'm going to start off with treatment. I, when, I, when, I, when I started in the Department of Corrections, uh, the, the initial study uh, was of uh, drug use of prisoners, as Eric said. We started on, on April 1st, 1970. Uh, testing everybody who came into the Superior Court, the main court uh, in the District of Columbia, uh, for drugs, and that has gone on every year since. It's it's continuous series, and you monitor the the drug problems with that. Uh, I did a study in the D.C. jail, and uh, that study showed uh, that the uh, the year of first heroin use, when you plotted that on time against the crime rate. They, the two uh, curves, the lines went right together. So what that did, that simple study uh, published in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine uh, demonstrated that the driver of the crime problem in the District of Columbia, primarily driver, was the heroin epidemic. Uh, and that led to, for me, the question, okay, uh, what do you do about it? Uh, and that got me involved in drug treatment. Uh, I went around the country and talked to the leading people I could find. I was particularly impressed by Vincent Dole and Marie Neiswinder in New York, who started uh, the methadone program there, but also Jerry Jaffe uh, in Chicago and others. Uh, and uh, on February 18th, 1970, I started the Narcotics Treatment Administration. Now, in the, in the uh, three years that, uh, uh, I mean, excuse me, over a five-year period, I was working in the nation's capital, but uh, NTA, uh, was uh, from 70 to 73, so three years. Uh, in that period of time, the uh, uh, monthly uh, FBI index crime rate dropped by 50%. Uh, heroin deaths dropped from 70 to 10. Uh, and it was all built on the study at DC jail and the work we did to uh, bring in treatment to the, to the city, uh, treating, as I say, uh, 18,000 people. It was also published in Science Magazine, and you'll see uh, that reference down at the bottom of this, this slide. Uh, now that experience in Washington was extremely important uh, to, to the country uh, as a whole because it was in Washington, it was very widely reported, uh, and uh, it was a, a model of scaling treatment to the size of the epidemic. No other city did that uh, in terms of the, the impact, uh, and it showed that a public health intervention could make a tremendous difference in a major social problem. That also was very important. And it set the stage for the FDA approval of methadone. Before NTA demonstrated this, uh, it was uh, an, an investigational new drug, uh, an IND uh, status, which was a very shaky status to have a major drug. Uh, and that FDA approval in 1973 was largely as a result of the work that, that we did in Washington. As a result of that, uh, I became the, the second White House drug czar on July 1st, 1973. Uh, and the, the, uh, public, the national interest in drugs really was focused not just on uh, overdose deaths and crime, but also on the Vietnam War uh, and uh, the uh, epidemic of heroin use in, in Vietnam, as we talked about with uh, Lee Robbins. That was very important uh, to that uh, activity. It, during my time as director of the Special Ab Action Office, Probably the most uh, important thing that happened in terms of a lasting effect was establishing the Monitoring the Future uh, study. I was the uh, person who got that started uh, uh, with Lloyd Johnston from the University of Michigan. And you're going to see some data from that uh, later on in, the, in this presentation. Uh, but I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that, uh, that that was one of our accomplishments there.
at, at NIDA from 73 to 78, uh, uh, the federal government uh, funded the uh, expansion of drug treatment in the country. Everything that is now in NIH and SAMHSA, at NIH and SAMHSA that had to do with drugs was NIDA. In other words, the NIDA at that time was different from the NIDA now. NIDA now is just research. Uh, when I was there, it had all the research that is there now. We, we had all the research was in the NIDA I ran. Uh, but in addition, we also had all the services activities and the prevention activities that are now in SAMHSA. Uh, and uh, it was a, a, a major uh, a period of time for the development of, of drug treatment and, and drug research uh, went on. And, and that I was very proud and pleased to be part of. Uh, but one of the things that's particularly interesting, I mentioned at the bottom of this slide, developed a career teacher program. Uh, it's hard to imagine now, but there were no academic studies uh, in uh, addiction and addiction treatment. Uh, and so the first studies uh, were started by uh, NIDA and NIAAA uh, uh, together. Uh, and I'm very proud of that, that that program that started at NIDA in those that time was essentially uh, the beginning of the medical specialty of addiction medicine. Now, to talk, move on to my time at, at the Institute for Behavior and Health starting in July of 1978 and coming to the present. One of the things that had happened, and you noticed in my uh, publications about the anxiety disorders, which is the, the other area of my, of my interest, uh, and that had got me very involved with the benzodiazepines, which have a very important uh, role in both addiction and in anxiety disorders. So that's, if somebody wants any questions on that, I'd be happy to talk about it. Uh, but I was also in the Institute for Behavior and Health, very involved with the parents movement from 1978 to 1992. And we're gonna talk about that when we talk about uh, marijuana a little bit later in this presentation. Okay, deep breath. Uh, now what we're gonna talk about, I wanna talk about uh, treatment uh, and uh, thinking about uh, new thinking about treatment. What is drug treatment? Uh, how do you evaluate it? Uh, uh, and the, particularly the, the concept I'm going to present, so I prepare you for it, uh, is establishing that sustained recovery is, this, the, uh, is the goal of treatment. That's, that's the goal we're trying to get to is sustained recovery. And when people talk to you about evidence-based treatment, Usually they're talking about evidence that the people who are in the treatment, uh, while they're in treatment, have less HIV or, or less overdose deaths or, or less crime. In other words, the efficacy is what's happening right then when they're in treatment. And what I'm suggesting, and you'll hear more about this as we go on, is that the, the ultimate goal of, of the treatment is getting people to not be addic actively using the drugs and into sustained recovery. So that's number one. You're going to hear a lot about that. Uh, the second area we're going to talk about is prevention. And uh, what I'm interested in doing, and you'll see this again coming up, is to denormalize youth drug use. Uh, and I'm going to focus on the deadly seduction of normalizing youth experimenting with drugs. So we hear more about that too. And then the third thing we're going to talk about is some of the future issues in, uh, in treatment and prevention, but also the role of the criminal justice system. I want you to remember that I started in the Department of Corrections not to punish people, but to use the criminal justice system as a major venue uh, for public health. Okay, let's do a little reality check to start with. Uh, uh, there's a lot of confusion uh, about uh, uh, what motivates uh, addicted people. How, how do they do it? There's a sort of a, a fantasy uh, that they're out there looking to come into treatment. Well, uh, the, again, the data uh, that's from the uh, household survey and the, and the uh, modern and future data uh, shows, this is a household survey, that 94% of the people with SUDs, substance use disorders, don't think they have a problem and don't want treatment. So if you start off thinking about drug treatment, thinking about the addicts that are out there dying to come into treatment, uh, there are some, but it's the very small minority on that. Second thing I want you to think about is DSM-5 makes diagnosis substance specific. It's an opioid use disorder. It's a marijuana use disorder. It's an alcohol use disorder. Uh, and that's, that's a problem. 
because you don't have very many people who are just using one drug. And we're going to talk a good bit more about that. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, the, the provision of treatment, that right now addiction treatment is siloed, it's separated from healthcare. Uh, and that's, that's a problem. Uh, MAT, as I said, I started at MIT. That's where I began. I'm very sympathetic with MAT. I'm not at all hostile to it. Uh, I revere Vincent Dole and Marie Neisweiger. I was there at NIDA when buprenorphine was discovered and started that, and also was a, was a, a pioneer in the use of naltrexone, which is now you see as Vivitrol. So I was, I was part of all of that. But the reality is that, that when Vincent Dole started MIT, the idea was the person would use it for a lifetime. It was like insulin for a diabetic. But the reality is that the average stay in methadone is six to nine months, and the buprenorphine is three to six months. Uh, and drug-free treatments are even shorter. So the reality is that the very large majority of, of patients in addiction treatment don't stay very long, and the disease is a lifelong disease. Uh, so that's a problem. And then finally, uh, in many treatment programs, people are continuing to use alcohol and other drugs while they're in treatment. That's a problem too we're going to talk about. Now, there's a, it, it's very important to, to, in terms of where we're trying to go with this, and you again, we'll hear more about it, uh, but uh, is, to, is to treat SUDs the way we treat other serious chronic disorders. And that is not siloed, but integrated within uh, the uh, entire uh, healthcare system going all the way from prevention to identification, intervention, treatment, and monitoring and follow-up. Uh, and that's not happening now. Uh, and that's something that we need to, to, uh, to make changes on. We also need to identify and address uh, co-occurring conditions, including uh, physical conditions, but also uh, mental health, health disorders, which are very uh, common. Uh, and uh, we'll move on from that. Now, in, in uh, about 15 years ago, uh, I was already well into this career, and it, it occurred to me that, that the treatment wasn't delivering uh, the outcomes that I had hoped for, uh, that uh, relapse was the expected outcome of treatment, uh, and that was not great. Uh, so the question I had was, okay, how good could treatment be? In other words, if you've got a biological disease here, uh, what, what is the gold standard? What, are we, what would we be the best you can do uh, in treatment of, of this disorder? And in my practice, I had many physicians, addicted physicians, who I was working with, and I observed how well they did. And that led me to look at how the nation treats addicted physicians, and that we have a, 50 states have state physician health programs. And I'm going to tell you more about that in this section of the presentation. Uh, but there are, th there's a pattern of what happens to physicians. Physicians come to the, the PHPs in a variety of ways, uh, but they generally are denying that they have a drug problem or alcohol problem. Uh, and uh, their, their people in their practice or patients or somebody uh, comes in and raises the question and they come before the uh, medical board uh, and they're referred, or they go by themselves, to the physician's health program. What happens then is they're evaluated uh, informally, uh, and if they are uh, identified as having a substance use disorder, uh, alcohol or other drugs, uh, then they are given a contract that is for five years. Uh, during that five-year period, they are randomly tested for any use of alcohol, or any use of drugs, uh, drugs of abuse, uh, and, and then they enter treatment. Typically, it's a residential treatment program of 30 days, maybe as long as 90 days, uh, but out of the five years, that's a pretty small part of the time. Uh, and, and then they're followed uh, for, uh, for the five years, and they're immersed in community support, mostly but not only 12 steps, Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous. But the most distinctive characteristic of this is the long-term monitoring with support uh, that goes on. 
Uh, and that's very important. And this concept of punishment is important. The physician's health programs have no punishment whatsoever. Uh, if somebody fails at it, relapses or drops out, they just go back to the medical board uh, rather than whatever else. But, but that system of care what fascinated me. And so I recruited Tom McClellan, who was the dean and still is the dean of treatment evaluation in the world, really, uh, to be a co-investigator with me uh, at the, uh, uh, funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, uh, to look at, for the first time, a national study of physicians in treatment. So here's another example of using science in the interest of policy. We wanted to know what happens, how do these physicians get there, and what happens to them. We found 904 physicians admitted to 16 PHPs, uh, and we had the follow-up data on 802 of them. Now, what we found is this, 64% completed the contract, 16% uh, uh, extended the contract. That is, when it got to the end of it, they said, I want to continue more, and 19% failed. Now, that doesn't mean that they're failed completely. It means on that particular contract, when people fail at a contract, they mostly come back and have another contract. So I, I don't want you to overstate it. This was looking at a single episode of care, uh, what happened to them. Uh, and what we found is that they, they, the people at the end of this uh, were generally doing well. As you see here, 78% were licensed and, and working, 4% uh, had retired, 11% had their license revoked, and 3% had unknown status. And this slide, I think, is particularly uh, uh, important to look at. I remember I was, I was talking about uh, random testing. Typically, at the start, it's once a week. So if you have a test today, you could still be tested tomorrow. Each day, the physicians had to call in or go online and see whether they had to be tested. And if, it, if, they, were, if they were supposed to be tested, they had to get there that day or they were in violation uh, of that. And in the five years, 78% never had a single positive test for any alcohol or any drugs. Uh, you're not going to find a lot of uh, samples like, like that. And of the people who had any positive tests for either alcohol or drugs, only 14% 14, uh, 14 of them had only one te positive test. Uh, so uh, that's, that's a remarkable outcome in terms of, in terms of the drug use of this, uh, this sample. And how did they do this? Uh, it's inspired remarkably by physicians who are themselves in recovery. Uh, many of the people today who are working in the physician's health programs are themselves in recovery. Uh, uh, and and th that th this is very important. It, it builds on and extends the su success. And there are similar models used for commercial pilots called the HIMSS program, uh, which uses the same kind of approach. And like the PHP program, uh, grew, grew out of the employee assistance programs, the EAP programs uh, that were widespread uh, in the country when this, uh, when this got started uh, in the early 1970s. So the question comes up, okay, Bob DuPont, uh, they do well when you're uh, testing them, but what happens when they leave? So we did a preliminary study five years after the completion of an SUD contract. We had eight PHPs that uh, we contacted and looked at the, what happened to those doctors uh, after they were no longer under mandatory testing. Oops, uh, and mandatory testing. 96% were reported being licensed at, to practice currently, and none reported a lack of license was related to substance abuse. 38%, uh, think about this, voluntarily extended their monitoring. Why would they do that? Why would they want to have more monitoring? There are two reasons uh, we found. One was that it gave them another reason not to use, uh, and two was it validated their sobriety. It validated that they were not using, and they found that very useful in terms of uh, dealing with uh, uh, medical boards and uh, licensing and all, all kinds of things. Uh, and, uh, and as you see, 89% completed the contract without any relapse. But this is the statistic that I find quite remarkable. 96% consider themselves to be in recovery at follow-up after, five years after the last mandatory uh, 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 testing uh, went on. Uh, in, in looking at that study, we also asked people to just comment on what they thought about it. And uh, the simple answer was 
they almost all were unhappy when they went into it and didn't like it, uh, didn't want it. Uh, but they came out uh, praising the program and talking about how it had saved their lives and saved their careers. And, and that's what's something that's so important to me to, to see that uh, because that's back what I was talking about, the hijacked brain. Now, when you're talking to somebody who's actively using, uh, you're talking to the drug, not to the person. Uh, and when you talk to that same person, uh, uh, physical person, when they're in recovery, you're talking to an entirely different person. Now I'm going to shift gears entirely and we're going to talk about prevention. Uh, uh, but I want to just say about the, the, the PHP data, that was a study that was done. It, it went on over the course of several years and uh, it, it absolutely shaped uh, the thinking about what treatment can do and how to do it and how it needs to be integrated. Not, not uh, short term, but monitored over a long period of time. And also the importance of the uh, recovery support, the role of the AA and NA in that story, uh, you can't miss. Okay, now we're gonna turn to prevention. 90% of substance use disorders, including especially opioid use disorders, are, are rooted in drug and alcohol use at the beginning in the teenage years. Uh, it's hard not to think about that, uh, see that as absolutely central uh, to the epidemic uh, of, of a drug, drug addiction. And it's very clear that the younger the person is when they start using drugs or drinking, the more at risk they are. And the vulnerability, one of the great achievements of NIDA uh, is the uh, un understanding uh, the biology of, of drug reward uh, and that the adolescent period is particularly vulnerable and the changes in the adolescent brain associated with drug and alcohol use are lifetime. They create a vulnerability that is for the lifetime. So when you're talking about uh, reducing the number of people, you've got to focus on youth. Uh, so we conducted two studies you're going to see data on coming right up. Uh, one from the, the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, that is the household survey, and the other is the Monitoring the Future. Uh, these were original studies that were done here at the uh, Institute for Behavior and Health. Okay, now this here, this takes a second to, to understand what this slide is. We looked at the people who were uh, age 12 to 17, that's the standard category that is used for uh, uh, the household survey. And we looked at people who in this 12 to 17 who used marijuana and those who did not. And the, so, so the two sides of this are all the sample in this uh, who were 12 to 17 who did not use marijuana. And you look at that and you'll notice that say, go over there to the, to the left, 8% of the people who had not used marijuana had in the past month used alcohol, 8%. Now go over to the, to the right side. The people who had used any marijuana in the last month, 44.6% had used alcohol. And you see that in the other things, the binge drinking, 3.5 and 27.5. Uh, uh, heavy alcohol use, 0. 0.4, 5.9. Uh, cigarette use, 2.7, 23.7. Uh, other illicit drugs, 2.2, 21.7. What does that tell you? That tells you that just knowing the issue, did that person, that youth, that adolescent, use marijuana or not in that month, tells you a lot about what was going on with the other drugs. Now, this is how you get into thinking about marijuana as a gateway drug uh, to look at this. But you, let, look, take a look at what this next slide is. Now we just looked at that same population about whether they used alcohol or not, not marijuana, whether they used alcohol or not. Uh, and, and you'll see the marijuana use is 3.5% of the person who didn't use alcohol, but it's 20% for people who did use alcohol. And if they binge drank, it's 34%, and if they were heavy alcohol use, it was 54%. What does that tell you? It tells you that the use of marijuana, other illicit drugs, and cigarettes is highly correlated with their alcohol use. Now look at this slide. This is doing the same thing with cigarettes. If they did use cigarettes, if they did not use cigarettes, the likelihood of alcohol use was nine, the, risk, the rate of alcohol use is 9.5. And if they did use cigarettes, it's 39.7, and you see the other data to go along with that. 
Now, when you take that all together, what does that mean? What that means is there are three gateway drugs, not marijuana, but marijuana and cigarettes and alcohol. Those are the gateway drugs for use. And it also, youth, and it also tells you if they use any of them, they're likely to use the other ones. And as you saw also, other illicit drugs show the same thing. So it remakes the, the gateway drug concept uh, around three drugs, uh, and it shows how they're all interrelated. And we're gonna talk some more about that in just a moment. So this has led to a, a, a focus here at IBH on what we call the one choice uh, uh, standard uh, for youth uh, and drug use. And this is, uh, for many people, radical. The, go the health goal for use, youth is to grow up without using, no use of alcohol, no use of nicotine, no use of marijuana or other drugs for reasons of health under the age of 21. So that is, that is what we're talking about, the one choice. Uh, and to refocus current programs, it, one choice is not a program. It's a goal, it's a, it's a health standard. It's the equivalent of saying the goals for youth is one hour a day of exercise, uh, or always wearing a seatbelt, or wearing helmets on a bike. Those are examples of health standards that we use. Uh, and people will say, well, but is that realistic? Is that even possible uh, to do that because of the widespread normalization of, uh, of drug use? Okay, Lloyd Johnson had never looked at this before I asked him to do it. Uh, in all these years of monitoring the future. Uh, lifetime abstinence, okay. This is, this is a, a past month use uh, in monitoring the future. And you'll see that low point is about 16% in 1983. In other words, in 1983, in the last month, 16% uh, uh, had not used any, of high school seniors had not used any alcohol, any cigarettes, any marijuana or other drugs uh, in, in their senior year in high school. Okay, so, so 1983. Now look at the number, it's now 51%. And look at the slope of that curve uh, over there. Now, here's, here's another curve. Th this, is, this is lifetime, this is in your lifetime, what percentage of high school seniors have never used any alcohol, any nicotine, any marijuana or other drugs. It was 3% in 1983. It's now 26%. And you see the 10th graders, and you see what that looks like, and the 8th graders. Now, I would bet not many of you who have seen curves like this. You don't, people don't realize how large your population is and how it has grown since the early 1980s. And that, those are very striking national data uh, from nationally representative samples. So what we're, we're interested in doing is getting people to think about this as a goal for health for youth. And people will say, well, not everybody's going to do that. Yeah, but we don't say to kids, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's questionable, you're not sure about uh, wearing seatbelts or these other things. Uh, we want to make sure that the kids here that this is the health goal because of the risks associated with it uh, and, and, and because of the particular vulnerability in this adolescent years. That's the basic idea that we're talking about. Okay, now I'm gonna shift gears again. Uh, we went to treatment, we went to prevention. I'm gonna have plenty of time for questions and answers, by the way, for, for all of you. Uh, and talk about uh, other issues that are going on right now in the criminal justice system and drug policy. The most destructive thing going on in drug policy right now is to, to, to say that the drug policy choice is between health care and the criminal justice system, it's sort of the way it's presented. Do you believe in, in health care or do you believe in prisons? Uh, and that is a very destructive way to look at uh, what's going on in, in, uh, in, in, in uh, drug abuse policy. The absolute goal is to have both systems work better together to achieve goals that neither can. And we're going to talk some about that uh, coming up in just a minute. Uh, but it won't surprise you that this is uh, uh, rooted in my own uh, commitment uh, to use my medical training to help the people who are in prison and help people stay out of prison. Uh, absolutely. So uh, 
And when about the roles of the criminal justice system in public health, let me just mention the two big ones. Uh, number one, supply reduction. If we don't have supply reduction uh, uh, enforced by criminal laws, we got a very serious problem in the country uh, in terms of uh, public health. And the second is uh, uh, people uh, who are uh, addicted can be uh, gotten into uh, treatment and into recovery through the leverage of the criminal justice system. And we'll, again, we'll talk some more about that. Uh, there are a number of programs, drug courts being the most prominent, but also a 24 seven sobriety and hope probation that use the leverage of the criminal justice system as an engine recovery. And they are my inspiration. That's what I'm very interested in doing and making that far more routine uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, throughout the country. I think it's really important to get that going. Uh, now let's step back together and look at what's going on uh, right now in, uh, with drugs and drug policy. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you know this, but overdose death is now the leading cause of death for Americans 50 and younger. Uh, that is quite a, st a statistic to think about uh, that. That's more than uh, cancer and uh, various kinds of illnesses, more than accidents, more than gun violence, more than anything. Uh, Overdose death is the leading cause of death for Americans 50 and younger. For the last three years in a row, the average life expectancy in America has declined because of the overdose death, largely that. Uh, and this is the first decline in Americans' uh, annual calculation of life expectancy since the flu epidemic in 1918. So those are headlines about the nature, the extent, the seriousness, the gravity of the public health problem we're talking about. And at the same time that this is going on, there is a tremendous effort to legalize and commercially uh, commercialize marijuana uh, and rebranding it as cannabis, uh, thinking about it as uh, uh, helpful, uh, healthful. Uh, and what we're doing is adding marijuana to alcohol and nicotine as drugs that are legal for adults. Now, let's keep a little perspective on this. We got 70,000 people dying of drug overdoses, 70,000. We think about 400,000 dying of nicotine as a result of health consequences and 100,000 from alcohol. And as Nora Volkoff, the current director of NIDA says, it's not that uh, the uh, uh, alcohol and nicotine are more uh, toxic drugs than the drugs that reduce. No, it's not that. It's because they're legal. Uh, and I think that's something to really uh, think uh, very deeply about. The most exciting or exciting, worrisome thing, serious thing going on is the, uh, the development of the illegal drug supply, uh, which has uh, moved very dramatically uh, from agricultural products towards synthetic products, uh, from oxycodone, let's say, uh, and heroin to fentanyl, uh, and uh, the, dr the illegal drug supply now is, uh, is, has higher potency, lower prices, uh, more effective distribution uh, than ever before. So I think there's a, a tremendous threat here that most people do not understand uh, how serious it is. The, one of the focuses that we have, and, and this again comes back to data, uh, the, the, the CDC data is not very good data because it's based on uh, self reported uh, data from medical examiners, which often don't report more than one drug. They just do it once they get one drug, they call it a drug overdose and it's in, it just over. But in Florida, uh, they've had a wonderful program that where they test uh, the, uh, the dead, uh, dead deaths for multiple drugs, and we find that 95% of the drug overdoses have two attempt more drugs, an average of two to four, as many as 16. And so the poly drug reality is the biggest thing that I want to uh, emphasize here. Uh, and of course, the culture shift uh, toward the normalizing of drug use, uh, which is going on, which I think also uh, uh, is, a, is a difficult uh, challenge for us. Okay, coming to an end, uh, I want to end two very destructive wars in drug policy. One is between medication-assisted treatment 
and programs that don't use medication, uh, oftentimes relying on the 12-step programs. Uh, and I, my peace plan I'm recommending uh, is to recognize that medication is used as directed uh, uh, in the absence of alcohol and other drug use is fully compatible with recovery. A lot of the people in the recovery community have a problem with that, uh, but uh, they need to get over it uh, and see that when a person is taking buprenorphine or methadone as directed and not using alcohol and other drugs, that's fully compatible with recovery. But by the same token, the people in the, meth in the MAT need to integrate the 12-step programs into their fellowships and focus on lifelong recovery support. Uh, and uh, that, that's the peace plan. Okay, there's another war going on between harm reduction and drug-free policies. Uh, and uh, all harm reduction uh, ideas are, have one core uh, value system and that is a goal, and that is to reduce the harms or some of the harms from drug use and alcohol use without stopping the use. In other words, that's the definition of a harm reduction. That's like needle exchanges or safe injection sites. They all have to do uh, with accepting the addict where he or she is and saying, how can I reduce the harms like HIV uh, or hepatitis C uh, without stopping the use. Uh, that's what harm reduction is. So here's the peace plan. Uh, to the extent that harm reduction leads, it's a, to the extent that it's a step toward sustained recovery, it seems to me it's, it's a wonderful thing. It can be an entry point into uh, recovery and, and putting a person on that path. Uh, but to the extent that harm reduction delays or substitutes for lasting recovery, in other words, to the extent that it's enabling, uh, that is not helpful. So the question about harm reduction is, how good is it at getting people into sustained recovery? Okay, what is our basic problem with all these drugs? Uh, and what's happening right now, and you see it in marijuana in, in spades, is commercialized recreational pharmacology. It's using chemicals that super stimulate brain reward in personally controlled ways for recreational purposes. And when I say commercialized, I don't mean just mean legalized commercialization. I'm talking about illegal commercialization also. Uh, remember that uh, drug users spend $100 billion a year for drugs. $100 billion, that's more than either alcohol or uh, tobacco are spent on illegal drugs in this country. And all the treatment in the country uh, is $34 billion. If there was drug users themselves could pay for all the treatment in the country, one third of what they pay for drugs. And drug users don't pay essentially nothing of their own money for, for treatment. That, it's very important to understand that. Uh, and that commercialized Recreational pharmacology is the core problem uh, uh, in these chemicals that super stimulate brain reward. And, and then here at the end, I would say what we've seen in the last 50 years is this is not a fad that's going away. Uh, no way. But there are many things that are positive to be looked at. One is the emergence of the recovery community. 22 million Americans are now in recovery. Uh, that is a huge uh, thing that's happened and the dramatic increase in young people who made the decision not to use any drugs. Those are two examples of very positive things. Last point, here's our websites for anybody who's interested in checking out any of this and getting more information. We've got that for you here. Uh, here's another picture of this uh, and we've got our references and I'll stop it there and turn it back to you, Aaron, for the Q&A. All right, thank you so much. That was really uh, uh, an incredible presentation, Dr. Dupont, and we greatly appreciate the wealth of information that you have shared with all of our viewers on a multitude of topics, including treatment and prevention and criminal justice and policy. And I'm sure that all of that has engendered a lot of thought and discussion amongst our viewers, and hopefully people will pick up the discussion on the End News Network, but we have had a few questions come in. And so I'm gonna transfer us over now to the Q&A and start with this question from a viewer who asked, 
about HAT in Europe. And he asked, considering the success of HAT in Europe, should we be considering that as a replacement for MAT here in the United States? What is HAT? <laughs> Good question. We'll have to see if that person can fill us <laughs> in on that one. Um, sure that. So I'll move, I'll move on to the next question, which is in the PHP okay, discussion, you reference zero tolerance policies with risks of losing licensure. This seems to contradict the assertion that these programs didn't include punitive measures for non-compliance. Can you reconcile the two points? Yes, I sure can. The physician's health programs are entirely separate uh, from the medical boards. All the consequent, negative consequence punishment are the medical boards. So the medical boards control the licensing of doctors. Uh, the physician's health programs just protect the uh, addicted physician from the medical boards. And person who, who thinks the, the physician's health programs are wrong, for example, can make the appeal to the medical board uh, and they can turn it over and say, I think you don't have a problem and you've got your license. The problem is most of them don't want to do that because they don't think they, are, will, they will be sustained at the board. Uh, but the issue isn't in the PHP, the issue is in the boards. Now, why do the boards do that? Uh, the boards do that for the same reason that we have uh, a zero tolerance for commercial drivers in the country and for airline pilots. And that is that the uh, medical boards are very concerned about the public uh, safety and health, and they don't want doctors who are addicted to drugs and alcohol practicing medicine. Okay, thank you. So our viewers have clued us in. HAT is heroin assisted treatment. So to go back to your ah, question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, if you give heroin addicts, opiate addicts, heroin as an alternative to uh, uh, methadone and buprenorphine, and certainly naltrexone, you'll get a lot of people interested in it. Uh, that's right. Uh, the, 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 the problem is that heroin, unlike buprenorphine and methadone, uh, is in, unstable. So you have to inject many times a day. Uh, and it also is very difficult to stabilize the dose uh, on heroin. You could get people in like that, but what would happen to them? I, I think it would be about like saying you could get a lot of alcoholics to come to you if you gave them alcohol. Uh, and that's true, you could. But the question would be, what do you do then uh, with it? Uh, I, what you'll find about the heroin assisted treatment is that they're very tiny programs uh, and they're mostly sort of making a political statement rather than a public health statement. Uh, I, I think people don't understand uh, that, that heroin is a very short acting drug. Uh, it's very unstable. Uh, you're going to be continuing to inject it. Uh, this is not smart. Both methadone uh, and, and buprenorphine have a, are not injected uh, and uh, you can stabilize your life. So. Uh, I don't think it, it moves us it moves us forward uh, to do that uh, at all. And I, I think you'll find in Europe uh, the the number of people who are going to do that is going to be in the hundreds in the entire continent. Uh, it's not going to be very many. Uh, and but we'll see. I'd be very interested to see where it, where it goes. And the question I really have is what I said. About, that's a classic harm reduction. That's an extreme harm reduction idea. Uh, and uh, the question will be, what happens? Does it, does it help people get into recovery or does it prolong their addiction? And I'm pretty clear it's going to prolong their addiction and the balance, but we'll see. I, that's a subject to uh, uh, study. Okay, thank you. So we have another viewer who was asking about the phrase sustained recovery. And I want to just remind everybody out there, please submit your questions and comments to the Q&A box. Don't raise your hand because we don't really have the ability to call on you and let you speak for yourself. Um, so this question was, when you use the phrase sustained recovery as the goal of SUD treatment, do you mean continued engagement with treatment support or abstinence from use of drugs? Well, it means abstinence from the use of alcohol and other drugs. Uh, you know, the, 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 we go back to the issue of the DSM-5 being substance specific. You could take the position, uh, for example, uh, that uh, recovery from an opiate uh, 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 use disorder would be not using opiates, but you could use methamphetamine, or marijuana, and alcohol uh, in that. Uh, and 
you know, that's not the way I'm using the, the term recovery. Uh, I'm using the term recovery as it is used in, uh, as I call it, the recovery movement uh, in, the, in the, the AA and NA uh, view. And that is not using any of those drugs uh, that are uh, addicting and, uh, and uh, 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 impairing uh, drugs. So that would include alcohol. So for me, in recovery means uh, what the PHPs are doing. That is no alcohol, uh, no drugs, uh, 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 no marijuana. Uh, so it's sustained, not using. And it's interesting to me about that, uh, about having that as a standard. It's interesting that, that when we talk about cigarettes, I think most of us understand uh, that when it comes to cigarettes, uh, the person uh, cutting down is better than drink, make, smoking more, but the goal is not to use it all. And we almost all know that we all know lots of people who stop smoking uh, and they, they don't chip, they don't go back and smoke every now and then. And we all understand that if they do that, they're very likely to reignite uh, that uh, brain reward a hijacked brain phenomenon, and it's likely to be a, uh, a, a long, a very difficult time for them to stop once they go back. We can think about that clearly about cigarettes, but we have a, a lot of people have a hard time thinking about that the drugs. But uh, to me, uh, that's what uh, recovery means. It's sustained. I use the term five-year recovery. I, I've also in this said, said sustained, but but what I really mean is five years or. or the, Put, it, put a number on it. And why is that? Well, first of all, we're used to the concept of five-year recovery in cancer. So we've got a, a model there, but there's a lot of good data to show that if a person has not used uh, for three to five years, uh, they, their risk of relapse or, or, or relapse to addiction is not very different from the person who never used. Uh, it's low. It's not zero, but it's low. So, but it takes time. It's not one year, it's not three months uh, of not using. That really hasn't changed anything very much. You're still at very great risk. And people who are in recovery will often talk about uh, what the early recovery is like and mid recovery and late recovery because the recovery is a process, not a state. That's why people say I'm, I'm in recovery, not I am recovered uh, in this. Uh, and I think those concepts are very important to understand where we're trying to get. And people again say, well, that's unrealistic. Yeah, but you got 22 million people who are in that stat status. And many of them, including patients that I have had over the years, uh, were hopeless addicts and had many years of desperate addiction. And when they get into recovery, they're different people. They are stable, uh, they're honest, uh, they're all the problems that was associated with their, their drug use and alcohol use is gone. Uh, it, it's the, the phenomenon of recovery is the inspiration of my uh, career. Uh, and I invite everybody who's, who's on this uh, webinar uh, to, to get to know the people, uh, who talk to people who you know are in recovery. Ask them, how did they get there? What was their life like when they were using? What's their life like now? How do they, how do they sustain recovery? Uh, people talk about evidence-based. I want to use the evidence of that 22 million people uh, and it's accessible to everybody. And the other thing I'd like to say to everybody on, the, on this is I'd like you to go to a few meetings of AA and NA uh, and see what's going on there to watch that process uh, go on. And it's uh, absolutely every community in the country has got uh, AA and NA meetings and other recovery support. Uh, that recovery support process uh, is, 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 a, is, is a, a, a wonderful thing uh, for the people who are in it, but it's also wonderful for those of us who are trying to help people with addiction uh, to give us evidence about uh, how those people got there and how they stay, stay, stay in recovery. Okay, thank you. We actually have a number of questions rolling in now from our viewers, so I wanna make sure that we can get to as many of them as possible in our remaining time. And I know a few of you were asking about the slides and when they would be available. So yes, we will make a recording of this webinar and a copy of Dr. DuPont's slides available on our website, which again is www.ndews.org. And just give us a few days to get everything organized and posted and um, I will let you know through the network uh, 
when the materials are available on our website. So we have some good questions coming up here. And the next one is from a viewer who was interested in the follow-up study you did with the doctors when you were doing your surveys. And this viewer was wondering how you were reaching the doctors in that survey. And if you thought that the doctors you were able to reach might have been substantially different from the doctors that you couldn't reach when you were doing your follow-up. So for instance, if you use their office emails, those who had to close their practice or were barred from practicing might not have had access to their email or their office phone. Yeah, well, let, let me clarify what the study was. Uh, it was a study of people who had successfully completed the program. So, so we did the whole sample was only people who had successfully completed. And the question was uh, not what happened to those who didn't complete it. We didn't do a follow up of that, but of those who did complete it. And what happened was that the, those, uh, I think it was eight uh, PHPs that participated, uh, they got a list of people who had left uh, five years before or more uh, and uh, communicated them mostly by email and told them about this survey and asked them if they would like to participate. And so it was the people who, who were willing to do that. And I think the number was only 42% of those who contacted, we're done, uh, did do that. So it wasn't everybody by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, whether the person who was unhappy and had done well would be more likely to respond than somebody who was done poorly and didn't like it, I, I'm not sure about that. It could be, but but that is definitely a limitation of the study. Uh, I, I have no doubt about that, and and I would like to see much more uh, uh, study uh, of this uh, of, and on longitudinal. As I mentioned, our study was just one episode uh, in, of care, uh, and what we found is something like a third of the people in our sample had been in PHP care before. So it's very common for physicians with addiction to have more than one contract uh, with the PHP. So there are definite limitations to that study. Okay, thank you. Now we have a question from a viewer who was looking for some advice from you, Dr. DuPont, and they're wondering how the original parent power group got started in the 70s and what you think is the best path to recreating one today? Well, that's, <laughs> I realize, Aaron, that we, we lost a slide. We, we had a slide that I put in there uh, just yesterday, and somehow we went back to the older slides here today, so we didn't have that. I got a, a wonderful slide. Maybe you can find it there uh, in the latest ones. It's, it's distinguished because it's got colors in it. It's yellow and green. Uh, kind of thing, and, and we didn't have that here. So if we could get that to put up, I would love to tell a story about it. Well, the parent, I was the director of NIDA, and I got a letter uh, from uh, a, 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 a mother in Atlanta, Georgia, named Keith Schuhart, and she said, Dr. DuPont, you're part of the marijuana problem in my family, and I'm mad at you about that, and you've got to get better about what you're doing. Uh, and uh, I was fascinated by, uh, in touch, I, mean, I was uh, concerned about this. I went down and met her uh, and uh, she said, you know, you're talking about marijuana globally and not just talking about marijuana and kids. And that's a separate topic. Uh, there's a debate about whether adults use marijuana, but there is much data about kids, uh, debate about kids. There's a clear, everybody can think it's a bad idea for kids to smoke marijuana. That's not a hard sell. Uh, and what you need to do is just focus on that. And I said to her, uh, uh, why don't you write that up and uh, see what we can do about publishing that? And she did, God bless her. And she wrote a book called Parents, Peers, and Pot. It was published by the government printing office in 1978. Uh, and more copies of that were published than any other book GPO had ever written. It was a massive uh, uh, event in the country to have this all over the country, a government published thing. I was very proud that I got her to do it. And she's a hero of our field. Uh, she, by the way, you know, this was picked up by Nancy Reagan in the Just Say No campaign. Uh, 
uh, is obviously very Republican. Well, Keith Stewart was very obviously Democrat. Uh, her brother uh, was the chairman of the Democratic National Committee to talk about politics and Clarence movement. But anyhow, she did that. And then the media picked it up. Uh, and uh, NBC had a program uh, called Reading, Writing, and Reefer, uh, an hour documentary about marijuana and kids uh, that was, uh, copies of that were in every school in the country. It was unbelievable. It was done prime time two or three times. Uh, and there was a, a sense of sort of coming together around the idea of, of kids not using. Nancy Reagan came into the White House uh, in uh, January 20th, 1981. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be one of the people she talked to. I went down to the White House and met her before she ever did anything with uh, Just Say No. And I was quite impressed by uh, what she knew about it, and her energy in this. And she picked it up and ran with it. Uh, but it was clearly not partisan uh, at all. But of course, her name was associated with it. Uh, but it was universal. The, the marijuana legalization movement almost died uh, between 78 and 92. It was a very, uh, it was moribund in the country. It's hard to imagine that now, uh, but that's what it was. And it all had to do with just focusing on kids uh, and, and their marijuana use. Uh, and it, it had a big effect. So it dropped youth drug use in the country by 62%. People talk about evidence. There is evidence. Uh, the youth drug use in the U.S. dropped by 62% between 78 and 92. Uh, that is a remarkable public health achievement. Uh, and uh, it, it was bipartisan, uh, absolutely. What happened to it? Why did it end? It ended because of uh, a group of people uh, got together and uh, created a, a new marijuana movement. Uh, they, they wouldn't let the people use the L word, legalization. They were just talking about medical marijuana. Uh, and that started in 1992. The first grants were made for that. And that uh, uh, movement uh, became a uh, 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 national movement. Uh, and so what you see is in this slide that if we can ever get it back, uh, to use it, uh, you'll see uh, the, there's a divergence in the movement of, in use of the uh, uh, mar marijuana versus alcohol and tobacco. You got big continuing declines with alcohol and tobacco, but marijuana starting in 1992 took a big jump up. So marijuana use in youth in the country passed cigarette use in 2008, and if you project the lines out, it's a it turned now to pass alcohol in about five years uh, in terms of youth drug use. Uh, and that, that has to do with the marijuana movement, which is very big in our country or around the world. Okay, thank you. We have a question now from a viewer who was interested in policy. And she asks, what do you see as the most important policy direction that local leaders should take at a community level? Practically speaking, with so little funding available, what would you see as the most effective strategy? Do you have any thoughts on that one? Yes, I do. I, I really think that, that, that uh, first of all, I think treatment is really important. I'm a big, you know, my life is addiction treatment, so I'm a big fan of treatment. But I really think it's important to get treatment uh, refocused on long-term recovery. Uh, and, and that, I think, is, is very important. But uh, the single most important thing to me is sort of the long term, which is help kids uh, grow up drug free, because that, 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 that uh, priming of the adolescent brain is such a big deal. Uh, so I think that really, if, if I was having one thing, that would be the one thing. But obviously, treatment is, is really important. But it's not just the treatment, it's the long-term monitoring. And, and my, my kind of vision is to get the families involved because families see the addiction. They see the problem. And what I would like to do is have a big effort to uh, reinforce families' role in helping people get into treatment, stay in treatment, get monitored by healthcare, and, and be in a role similar to what the physician's health program has done uh, to, uh, to make sure. Now, that's a big ask, uh, 
because it means the family's getting involved uh, and identifying the problem, and it means supporting them in helping the people stop using drugs. But remember that people don't want to stop using drugs. Uh, it, that's, that's the problem, and that's what the families have. Uh, they have, they see the relapses, they see the failures. It's 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 heartrending uh, to see that there aren't very many people who die of overdoses who are just starting to use drugs. That that does happen, but that's rare. Most of the people who are dying of overdoses are in their 30s and 40s, and not even teenagers. The teenage rate of uh, overdoses is very low in this country. It's the 30s and 40s and 50s who are dying. They're chronic addicts mostly uh, who are dying. They've had lots of treatment. Uh, but to, to get to, to, to do that, but also to realize that we're up against something pretty uh, challenging. It, it, you know, the idea that somehow this is a, a fad or some minor uh, issue in, uh, in the country. No, that's not right. It's, it's a very bigger, much bigger uh, problem than that. And, and the money involved in it is huge, huge. And once you get legitimate commercial interest involved, which is happening now with marijuana, that just uh, ratchets it up uh, exponentially. Uh, that's what's going on right now. Okay, thank you. So we do have a number of other questions that I'm just trying to scan through. I'm sorry, we're not gonna be able to get to all of them, I don't think this afternoon, but we'll get to a couple more at least here. We do have one from uh, another member of our NDUs scientific advisory group who asks a question that we all, I think, spend a lot of time thinking about and struggling with. And that question is, why is there such a high demand for illicit drugs in the United States? Okay. Yeah. I, so take that one on. But I, but I, but I, that, that, I, you couldn't have a better question than that for me. I really appreciate that, Aaron. Uh, the problem, much of our thinking about drug use is to identify uh, problems with the drug user, you know, like uh, depression, for example, or poverty or uh, uh, trauma. I mean, we've got all kinds of things we look at uh, as, uh, uh, as, as the causes of the drug use. But what's missing is that the drugs really work. And it doesn't, you don't have to be a poor person or a minority group, they really work. They, they stimulate brain reward. You can see this with animals in a laboratory. Uh, uh, when you give the laboratory animals uh, drugs, like cocaine, for example, but all the drugs, uh, the animals will uh, prioritize the drugs over other rewards, including the ones that are, what, what the brain reward system is all about is uh, food and sex. Uh, and they will prioritize the drugs over that. Uh, so the, the drugs essentially hijack the brain's reward center. People say, well, the drug is a, is a brain affecting drug. Well, that's true, but it's not just a brain affecting drug. It affects the specific parts of the brain that have to do with reward. Those are built into the brain to control behavior. And they're there for good biological reasons. And what's happened is human beings alone, there's no animal model in nature of drug use. The animals don't ever have any access to drugs like this. Uh, there's no protection in it. And so when they use the drug, they like the drug. They, they find it uh, attractive if they'll keep using it. You, you don't necessarily like it the first time, although some do, uh, but you sort of learn how to do it. Uh, and when you do, a lot of people uh, have, lose control and all the rest. So I think it's rather than thinking about there's some segment of the population uh, that is uh, vulnerable, is to say everybody's vulnerable. Uh, and and uh, the, 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 uh, the key to, to it is deciding you're not going to use chemicals stimulating brain reward for pleasure, that that's a dangerous activity. Uh, that has bad outcomes uh, for folks. And that's a, that's a big step uh, for people to think. They, they normalize uh, the use of, of chemicals, not, not food, uh, you know, or, or other things like that. I'm just talking about chemicals. You look at what the drugs are. They're not food. Uh, they, they are very specific chemicals uh, 
that have a specific brain effect uh, and they are disorganizing of brain function. Uh, that you see with, high, uh, with high, uh, highway fatalities and, and the disruptions of people's lives. The other thing that's very clear about it, there are two features of addiction. One is continued use despite problems. A lot of times you've got a problem, you stop, but no, not with addiction, you keep going. And the other is dishonesty. And people say, why is it dishonesty part of it? And that's because people around the drug user want the person to stop. The doctor wants them to stop. Their family wants them to stop. Lots of people want them to stop. And they don't want to stop. So the only way they can keep the relationship and keep the drug is to lie. So there's a, a, a corrosion uh, of the character associated with the addictive use of drugs. Uh, so I, I think that uh, why it's there is because of the brain. And it is not going away. And there is no protection for that from these, from these chemicals. You know, there's an interest in having vaccines and about medication tr treatments for specific drugs. But the problem is all the vaccines and all the medicines are drug specific. They're drug specific. The, the illness is not drug specific. So if you had a vaccine for one drug, you've got a thousand others uh, to use. Uh, so we got to have a bigger uh, frame than just one drug at a time. And if you'll notice, the way our country reacts to drugs is just one drug. Uh, we got one demon drug and we're going to focus on Now it's opioids. It used to be Oxycontin. Now it's fentanyl. Well, or methamphetamine. Or now people are talking about cocaine again. But, but it isn't really about any drug. And, and if you stop one drug, there's lots of other drugs. Uh, it really is fundamentally about that demand. Uh, and the demand is based on uh, the uh, uh, the fact that the people like it and they prioritize it and they'll spend money on it. You know, so it's just hundred billion dollars. A lot of that is spent by some of the poorest people in the country. Uh, it isn't just the rich people who are doing it. Uh, and so I, I think that having that, what, what shall I say, that uh, sober sense of what the risks are is important to understanding this problem. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to just do two more questions this afternoon before we start wrapping things up. And I, I also want to, as we're talking about the last two topics, start our poll. And so I hope you guys will give us some feedback on this webinar and, and what future topics you would be interested in. So I have launched a poll. So if you'll answer those questions, that would be great. And in the meantime, just to let you know, we have two webinars coming up in March that we're very much looking forward to. First will be on March 13th, and that will be a presentation by Jill Head, our colleague at the DEA Special Testing Lab. She's chief chemist there, and she's going to be giving us her annual report on drug threats in the United States. And then following that, later in the month, we will have a webinar featuring several of our and do Sentinel community epidemiologists who are going to be discussing methamphetamine and how methamphetamine use has changed in the United States and in their locations in particular. And so I hope that you'll be able to join us for those and please keep an eye out for our announcements on the network and on our website, endus.org. And we look forward to seeing you again then. And in the meantime, we have another policy question here from a viewer who asks if you can characterize the relationship between prohibition-oriented drug policies and the development of novel synthetic drugs. Many posit that the former is the primary driver of the latter, and your thoughts on the matter would be appreciated. Yeah, I'm not sure uh, how, what we're talking about. The, the, the alcohol prohibition is an interesting model. Uh, alcohol was prohibited in this country nationally from 1919 to 1933. Uh, the first state prohibition was the state of Maine, I think it was 1857. So by 1919, most of the states in that country were already uh, dry uh, with prohibition. And uh, Franklin Roosevelt, the first thing he did when he was elected president in 1932, uh, he came into office in March of 33, uh, was repeal alcohol prohibition. Uh, and uh, it's, it's interesting that, uh, that when that happened, uh, the alcohol consumption in the country was very low during Prohibition. 
uh, and it came up very slowly. Uh, it peaked at per capita uh, consumption uh, after prohibition in, in the mid 1980s, and it's going down now, which is kind of an interesting thing to think about. But what was I'm bringing up is it didn't just go jumping right up. Uh, it came up sort of slowly over and relentlessly over the course of 50 years uh, to, to reach its peak. And that when people talk about legalizing marijuana, they think, well, not everybody's using it. That's right. It takes a while uh, for this to, to, to really come on. But the idea that, that, that the, uh, having legalized drugs, like let's say marijuana, is going to stop the illegal market, which is the assumption a lot of people have made, has not been the case. Uh, illegal marijuana is very, the market is very vibrant in places like Colorado, which have wide open legal uh, marijuana. And, and that's because the legal marijuana pays the taxes and the illegal marijuana doesn't. Uh, what, what happens is they build each other's business. It's not one way or the other. And the idea that somehow prohibiting a drug, I, you know, it's interesting, well, heroin is prohibited. Uh, do we think that uh, we would reduce the heroin problem by legalizing it? Uh, it's a little hard for me to get my head around that idea. So the idea that somehow prohibition causes the problem, I don't think so. Uh, uh, unless you're prepared to legalize any drug. I mean, that's, people do talk that way, but I can't imagine that a, that a sane person would think that we could expose the population to drugs that have these characteristics of a super stimulation of rate and reward as a as a public health uh, idea. Uh, I, I don't I don't think so. I, so I, I have trouble with the idea that prohibition is the problem. There's a long history though about that issue. Uh, a fellow named Alfred Lindesmith uh, was a sociologist from the University of Indiana, and he wrote a book, a couple of books uh, in the 1960s uh, and earlier uh, about saying that the real the reason people use heroin is because it's, it's prohibited. And what he wanted to do was give people heroin because in those days, the British system, as it was called, was doctors prescribing heroin uh, to people. And uh, they thought that would be a very helpful thing. Well, you see how it worked out in Britain. They have, first of all, they stopped doing that. And second of all, they have a tremendous heroin problem in, uh, in Britain. So I don't think down that road is, uh, is, is anything very helpful from a, from a public health point of view. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you again to all of you who submitted questions to us today. And if we didn't get to your question and you're looking for additional information, I know some of you were interested in more information about certain kinds of treatment modalities and how to assess the quality of treatment programs and um, how to educate parents and get them involved in what's going on. So please reach out to us, give us an email at endus at umd.edu, and we'll be happy to get in touch with you directly with any information that we have. And we'll also continue to talk with Dr. DuPont offline and, and put together some additional information that we might be able to share on our website. And so again, we hope we'll see you at our upcoming webinars in March with Jill Head and our, our colleagues are Sentinel Community Epidemiologists. And so keep an eye out for our announcements. And just as one closing question here, we had heard from an attendee who was mentioning the stigma associated with addiction and recovery and asked how you think we can reduce this stigma and propagate the message that addiction is a disease that requires treatment and this can be potentially a long-term treatment. Uh, yes, you know, I, I want to destigmatize the addictive person, but not the addictive behavior. Uh, and that's a, that's a subtle distinction to understand because the addictive behavior uh, is, uh, is undesirable behavior from a social point of view and for the, uh, the person with the, with the, with the problem. Uh, I want to celebrate recovery uh, and have uh, uh, the, the uh, people in recovery are the heroes and heroines of, of, the, of this field. Uh, I think that's important. But to normalize addictive drug use, I don't think is a great idea uh, from a public health, uh, from a health public health point of view. But I've spent my life respecting people with addictive problems. Uh, and I care about those people. That's what I'm doing. So I think it's possible uh, to, uh, 
to say that addictive drug use is undesirable behavior and I care about and respect the person who has that disorder. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Again, we really appreciate all the information that you shared with us this afternoon, Dr. DuPont. And thank you so much for everyone who joined us today. And we look forward to seeing you at our upcoming webinars and to hearing from you on the Endus Network. So thanks a lot. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Mm -hmm.